All right, good morning. Well, you are here on the right day. I'm here to tell you because today I'm going to talk about how to shape up other people. Now, I don't know about you, but I seem to always have somebody in my life that I feel could use a little shaping up. You know, if I could just raise them up a little bit, then they'd be okay. You know? Uh, now, we probably all have someone or someones that we would like them to be, say, or do differently than they are currently being and saying and doing. I think this is especially true when we are in close relationships with someone. It seems to me the closer in we are, the more we are vested in them being different. Isn't that how it works? At least I think so. I mean, think about family members, our partners, parents, children, close friends, co-workers. Uh, you've heard me tell the story of this woman who I was asking her about uh, what she thought her, her gift might be. Uh, and she said, oh, oh, I know what my gift is. I see other people's faults. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's, that's not really a gift. It's, <laughs> that's, um, that's actually 180 degrees in the other direction and I'll leave it to you. Uh, so here's the thing. What we teach in the science of mind is that all minds are connected. So what you think about somebody else, because you are connected with them, they actually receive on some level. Ew. I know, huh? So on some level, even though you're smiling at them and being really sweet and talking in a really sweet voice, if on the inside there is a part of you that's wanting and wishing and hoping they're going to be different, the message they are getting on the unspoken level is you're not okay. Now, have you ever had somebody in your life who was basically giving you a message that you were not okay? Doesn't feel very good, does it? So why do you think someone's going to want to change for you when the message you're giving them is you're not okay? What they want to do is get away from you, is what they want to do. No, really. This is true because all minds are connected. So your disapproval, you're thinking somebody needs to be different, even if you don't say those words out loud, at the subjective level, they are getting that message. They're getting that message. Now, we all know this. We've known this since our first psychology class, that most communication is nonverbal. What does that mean? Most communication is nonverbal. It means they're getting it subjectively because it's what you really hold on the inside. God, yes, you're terrific. I wish you'd be different. Come in a little closer so I can change you a little more. Right? There are two prevalent and destructive illusions that I think people believe when they're in relationships. One, get ready. This person will change by virtue of being with me. Yes, yes. And, you know, and I will help them to change. Just, just they're being with me. That's going to do it. The other one is this person will never change at all and will remain exactly as they are now and forever. Now, here's how I think the principle works. Is that we love people the way they are right now. And in that love, they have the freedom to bloom, grow, evolve, and change. Because they feel nothing but love, which we know is the best place for change to take place, for healing to take place. You know, there's not a lot of room for truth or for consciousness in the kind of thinking that says this person will change when I get my hands on them or they're never, ever, ever going to change at all. See, both that kind of types of thinking, those are what we would call error thinking or even uh, both of those things are an illusion because they have no basis in spiritual truth. People are continually changing. No one can escape the process of change. Even though you've seen somebody and you, you hadn't seen in 20 years, and you say, oh my god, you haven't changed a bit. No, on the inside, they have changed. Because in Science of Mind, we teach that everybody gets to grow, everybody gets to heal, everybody gets to be more and better than they've ever, ever been before. However, no one can change anyone else. I know, isn't that disappointing? That's just extraordinarily disappointing. We can change ourselves. We can make new choices. We can reprioritize our values. We can work on our consciousness. But we can't predict how other people will grow, how they will evolve, how they will change, or at what rate. Now remember this. This is enormously important. Every soul on the face of the earth came in with their own curriculum 
with their own special evolution. People are here to grow and heal and evolve according to their own spiritual curriculum designed by them and God. We'll just say it that way. Hmm? So we don't know what other souls are here to evolve through. Hmm. We can work on our part, right? It's like saying I can work on my side of the fence or I can work on my part of the garden, which basically is doing my own inner work. And hopefully we could provide a good role model of, of, uh, uh, of good spiritual consciousness. We can create a safe environment that is conducive to change, but none of that will guarantee that another person will change. You know, oh, they, none of that will guarantee that another person will change the way we think they, may, they need to change. So if I think I'm powerful enough to change this person, that thinking is the fallacy of codependence in small children. Yeah, that's what it is, right? If only I'm good enough, if only I do the right thing, if only I keep my room clean, if I get straight A's, this other person will change. Now hear this, okay? So if you've been nodding off, this is the time to just wake up and make a note, okay? Other people do not change unless they choose to change. That's it. No, think about it. Have you ever changed because somebody really wanted you to. No. We change when we have, when we ourselves have a compelling reason to change. That's why we change. They're a spiritual being, just like we are. They have their own path, just like we do. You know, they will not change when the responsibility or need for change is not their own need or their own responsibility. Because they won't if they don't want to, you know? Uh, I know, it's so, it's so against everything we thought. Because, you know, we think, we're smart people. If I can just lure them in, you know, get my hooks into them, I'm sure that over time I can mold them, shape them, and turn them into the person I want, to be, want them to be. See, see, we only have control over changing ourselves and our consciousness. Wanting someone else to change will not make the change occur. You know, when all our effort to get them to change doesn't work, it eats away at our own self-esteem and actually can make us sick. See, we, I think we probably all have some understanding of this. I know we're all clever and we all want what we want, don't we? Yeah. And are any of these approaches familiar? I will demand that they change. Change, gosh darn it, change, yes. Or, I will, con I will cajole. Come on, do it for me. I will manipulate. Oh, this is fun. Let's see how I can make them be different without their knowing that I'm doing it. You know? You know uh, and, and maybe this might include a little bit of, well, if you love me, or after all I've done for you, you should change. That's under the manipulation category. Threatening. Hmm, yeah. Change or else. Ordering someone, you will change. You know? Begging someone, please, 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 please change. Bargaining, if you'll change, I'll do this. Pleading, for the love of God, please be different than you are. <laughs> all this produces a discouraging and destructive environment. Really, it does. First of all, being part of all this negativity changes only ourself for the worst, OK? We're doing less than the best for ourselves and for the other person, you know, and we're engaged in behaviors that are not conducive to our own good health, mentally, spiritually, physically, to our own self-esteem. The other person just keeps doing what they're doing. Have you noticed that? And now they're blaming you for producing so much negativity and so much destruction in their environment. See, only amateurs think that they can be the, a therapist or a practitioner or spiritual counselor or healer for people in their own family, right? You know, because otherwise, you just know it's, I'm too close in, you know? Because it's a fact. You can't be objective, you know, around those that you're really closely involved with. I think another fact is it's darn near impossible to provide constant, unconditional acceptance to someone who is intimately connected with your own life. Right? So here's the deal. You have to take care of yourself and your consciousness first, 
Take responsibility for your life first. Do what you have to do to ensure that your life is the best it can be. Now, doesn't that sound simple? Yeah, not so easy. You know, so you want to focus your need for change on what you can change. So when I catch myself thinking, God, I wish they'd be different, what I have to ask myself is, how can I be different? What in me needs to change so that I am accepting of them and who they are and where they are? And so practicing acceptance toward yourself and others, I have a couple of techniques for us to do this morning. They will not be unfamiliar to some of you. And the first is this, is this love prayer that we do in a lot of our classes. And so when you catch yourself and you're wanting someone to shape up, what you must say to yourself silently or if you're doing your practice is, I bless you, I accept you. I bless you, I accept you. And you can put the person's name in. So I always use Ernest because he created our church. So I'd say, I bless Ernest, I accept Ernest. I bless Ernest, I accept Ernest. See, there's no, I bless you if you change or I accept you if you're different. It's just the way you are now. The other technique that I recommend that I think is really, really helpful is when I praise and raise you. So I praise Ernest, I raise Ernest in the name of love. I praise Ernest, I raise Ernest. So what does that mean? It means I'm recognizing the divinity that they are and I'm holding them up to that place of the highest and best within them. I praise Ernest, I raise Ernest in the name of love. So you know the only method Jesus ever used to change other people was to correct his own thought, his own thought about them. You know, when somebody was sick and needed healing, he didn't say, oh my God, you're so sick. I don't know. This is going to be hard. Let me get the disciples in. Maybe together we can work something out here. No, he had to correct his thinking. It's like, and, that, and what we mean by that is he had to look at you and see the God in you, the spirit in you, the truth in you, and not the illness, not the condition that needed healing. And in focusing on the God, the spirit, the truth within you, he knew that was more real than the appearances on the physical level. So this is what we do in metaphysics. We handle our own thought, not other people's. You know, there's that wonderful teaching in A Course in Miracles, and I use this all the time, would you rather be right or happy? And I know if you're like me, I say, well, I'll be happy if I'm right. You know, but that's not the offer. Would you rather be right or happy? And the truth is, I think, at least from the big spiritual picture, we want to be happy. People often ask, how can I pray to change another person? You know, they'll come to me and say, well, my son is doing something I really don't like. How can I pray to change him? You know, or my spouse is doing something. How can I pray to change them? Well, first of all, it's karmically incorrect to pray for somebody to be different against their will. Now, if they come to you and say, please pray for me because I want to change this in my life, you're on. You're on. That's great. But for you to essentially pass a judgment and say, but I just know it would be so good for them to stop drinking or stop doing this or stop doing that. Or da, 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 da. That's you. Let's get, let's be, that's all your stuff. I remember a woman came to see me and she wanted me to treat for her son to stop drinking. He was a grown man. And I said to her, do you want, does he want to stop drinking? And she went, oh God, no, he's a drunk. He loves it. And I said, well, then I can't do that. And she was really mad. She was mad that I could not treat, pray in the affirmative for her son to stop drinking. And I said, but here's what I can do. I can pray with you to know that the spirit of God within your son is absolutely perfect and that that spirit of God within him does not hunger or thirst for anything that isn't for his highest and greatest good. That there is a part of him that does not crave anything that doesn't support the life abundant. Mm, it was a little better but it wasn't really what she wanted. She wanted me to do a little magic on him, you know, a little hocus pocus and do a kind of a divine manipulation to make, but you know, I don't know and you don't know and she doesn't know. He may need to do what he's doing for another week or another month or another year before he's ready, before spirit within him says, okay, now is the time. Hmm. Most people, I think, when, when confronted with a difficult person, they forget the biblical phrase from Isaiah, look unto me and be ye saved, which means look, look to God instead, right? They look unto the person and then they're hurt and confused and angry. So the metaphysical truth is if we see people as needing shaping up, we're not realizing that we are starting uh, uh, 
or stating, I'm sorry, our own insufficiency in handling our own mental response to the problem, right? So I'm not doing my own inner work seriously enough is what it comes to. What's important is my state of consciousness as I respond to the person. Look, everybody's doing what they're doing. The only place I have control is how I respond. I can't just let my five senses go wild in reaction to everything other people do. Beyond my senses, I have to know there is a greater spiritual truth. So according to my current state of consciousness, that's how I see the world. So if I look at Jesus as teacher, people did what they did, but because of his controlled thinking, the seeming evil never confounded him, right? Because his thinking was in the right place. So, so Jesus could see God in all people and everywhere because he had only God in his own thought. And so he responded, he responded only to God's presence. I think we probably have moments of that. We have little windows of that. And then somehow it kind of fades away, you know? So I believe we can do that. In Science of Mind, we teach, you know, that our opinion of the world is the result of our mental reaction to it. So we all bring something to the seeing. Everybody understands that. We bring something to the seeing based on our past, our experiences, our history. And the people in our lives are to us what we mentally conceive them to be as a result of our mental response to them. Right? So we have an interaction with somebody. Right? You, you, you have an interaction with somebody. And it stays with us. That's, that's our consciousness. You know, They did not move into our head unless we let them. So how many times, how many times have people said something good to you, something good to you, something good to you, and then there's this one little thing that somebody says, oh, but, just the tiny little thing, the tiny little thing, and you leave, and all you can remember is that tiny one little thing that somebody said. And you think, oh, why did they say that? And I'm sure if they knew me, if they got to know me, they'd really like me. I mean, I'm a pretty nice person. How could I change their mind about that? And we go on and on with the one little thing, the one little thing. Even though everything else can be overwhelmingly positive and life-affirming, the one thing that somebody says takes us down the drain. Mm. No one is the thinker within you but you. And if you think and speak negatively about someone, that person is not to blame for your mental response to them. Right? You are the only thinker in your world of which you are the center. So if you continue to be upset, it's because you are carrying a wrong pattern of thought, the science of mind teaches us. You don't understand the, the reason why I feel this way. You know, that's what people say to me. You don't understand. If you had someone like this in your life, if somebody did this to you or said this to you, we do not want to justify wrong thinking, right? We're not going to get on board with you and say, yes, you are a hopeless, hapless victim. We know that about you. No, we're never going to do that, right? We're not going to agree. We're not going to get in the sinking ship with you of wrong thinking. When the old reaction appears, remind yourself, this is not the truth of God. Therefore, it is not the truth of this person. I behold only God in this person in front of me. And over time, they will no longer annoy you. Why? Because they're boldly living their life anyway. So the thing is, it won't always be grabbing at your attention. If I correct my own state of consciousness, then I can change my reaction to anyone. Because I will know how to control my own mental responses. It's an interesting time we live in. It's a really good time to control your own state of consciousness, right? I am the thinker in my consciousness, and the law of mind produces what I think. Everyone, everyone in my life is the incarnation of God. This is true if they know it. It's true if they don't. So we must be faithful to what God is in us. We aren't here to shape up other people. We are here to shape up our own consciousness. Let's pray. So, thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, remembering that right here, we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving presence. And that spirit of God within us is the most true, real thing about each and every one of us. And so in this awareness, I speak the word that we are open, willing, receptive vessels, and we allow people to be who they are with an energy of love, with an energy of complete, complete permission, 
with an energy of allowing, that people are doing what they're doing because it's their journey. And we get to be in charge of our own response, our own mental household. Like the great spiritual teachers before us, we get to be in charge of our own thinking. So we include in our prayer today anybody that we've been thinking about changing, anybody we're wanting to be different, and we just simply allow them to be. We bless them and we accept them. We bless them and we accept them. And then we praise them and raise them in the name of love. We praise them and raise them in the name of love. And so we include in our prayer our family members and friends, parents and children, everyone we hold near and dear. And we know that right where they are, the fullness of God's spirit is present, that they are healed and whole and loved and their needs are met. We let our prayer be a blessing energy in the world that we live in. So we let our intention be that this prayer of love and peace and healing goes out and surrounds the entire globe, touching all people everywhere, including everyone in our own country. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is an opportunity for great healing for each and every one of us, and we say yes to it. And so with a full heart, I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.